No. I have, I have you know, uh, an introduction not long enough to warrant water or anything kind of LJ <laughs> and lovely. Um, other than the sort of rare pleasure not to introduce people, which is obviously not rare in the least, but to introduce people that you actually like and respect, which is sort of a rare thing. And it's very true in this case for both uh, Jason and Stephanie, who are both good friends and people whose thought I take extremely seriously. So uh, I have you know, no particular comments other than my excitement to hear them talk about forms of life by two actual life forms that I like spending time with. I will say now that I think we need to question why form of life as opposed to just life form. I think it's actually a significant question to talk about. But so as for the formal thing of these two people, Stephanie Wakefield, who will be speaking first, is a PhD candidate. Sorry, Jason Smith, who will be speaking first, uh, assistant professor in graduate studies in the art department at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. He writes on contemporary art, continental philosophy, and political theory. His work has recently appeared in Critical Inquiry, Critical Companion to Contemporary Marxism, Grey Room, Heresia, and Theory and Event, among other places. With Philip Armstrong, he recently, pub recently, wow, he recently published a long interview with Jean-Luc Nancy uh, called uh, Politique et au-delà from Galerie in 2011. And he's currently writing a book on the films of Guy Debord. Stephanie, conversely, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science at the City University of New York's Graduate Center. She teaches in the Urban Studies Department at Queens College. Her dissertation is uh, the environment machine, in quotes, which brings together Heidegger and crisis management, the ontology of new urban environments, as well as theories of technology and decline. And she's working on a book on the, the writings of Rainer Sherman. So without delay, I believe Jason first and uh, Shirley. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, Kevin, thanks Nathan, uh, and thanks Pitar, um for having uh, me here. I'm very happy to be here, happy to be in Zagreb, and happy to be at uh, Amala, um, which I knew, uh, if not well, I knew quite a bit about from the last conference two years ago in materials, and at least my sort of uh, voyeuristic spot from uh, half a world away. Uh, I just want to mention that um, Petar uh, remarked that in the past, the sort of um, the sort of interventions around the figure of life um, have largely sort of addressed um, the kind of biopolitical uh, constellation of terms um, that are sort of inflected in a kind of political way uh, in Italy over the last ten years, and that the idea for this particular um, sort of gathering was to sort of take a step beyond that. I just want to warn you that that's not going to happen uh, this morning. <laughs> so we, in a combined and uneven development of, of MAMA, we are the sort of backward uh, sort of panel, I guess, or at least I'm the backward uh, person on this panel. Um, so in any case, um, the, the question of form of life, um, this kind of theme or problem that was sort of decided upon, uh, I guess, um, amongst uh, sort of Nathan and Stephanie and, and myself. And it's a term which, um, I wanted, I've never really sort of uh, wanted to uh, sort of think about, um, and it's sort of uh, it's bothering me for the last I don't know, uh, ten years or something like that. So I actually tried to um, figure out what the term meant, um, and uh, it's a little work, and um, I didn't get farther than a very short essay by uh, George Ogamu um, from 1993, a very small piece, which I'm sure many of you've read, uh, in Means Without Ends. And so, in a way. Um, that becomes a kind of starting point, and I'm not sure I ever leave that uh, particular uh, text, but um, I'll do my best to try to open it up to um, some problems that might be of relevance to uh, people who are beyond uh, the problematic of form of life and by the political uh, sort of threads of any particular thought. Okay, we, uh, and I'll try to, I might just cut myself off at a certain point because I don't want to suck too much air out of the room. Mm -hmm. Okay, quote, debates about the real meaning of the words life and death, remarks the Nobel Prize winning biologist, British biologist Peter Medivar, are signs in the field of biology of a low level conversation. These words have no intrinsic signification that might be clarified by a more attentive and deeper study, end of quote. To ask the question about the meaning of life and death is, for the scientists, to ask a dumb question. A question best left for those who have the hardest time rising above low-level conversations 
It's best left to philosophers. For the distinction between science and philosophy is determined by the type of concepts each produces. Where philosophy pretends to develop rigorously determined concepts to produce clear, distinct ideas, scientific concepts are what we can call, to retrieve a useful distinction proposed by William Fink, operative rather than thematic concepts. Units deployed in a practice that constitutes or produces, through its interventions, the objects it seems to be describing, or measuring, or evaluating, and so on. The spontaneous philosophy of scientists is therefore both a condition and an effect, and effect of scientific practices. And science has neither the obligation, nor the capacity, nor even the right to produce theoretical concepts that might rigorously delimit the field of life, precisely by drawing the distinction between life and its limit, death. On the other hand, it's possible to contend that for philosophy, any discussion of life, of its concept, first of all, but also, and importantly, its sense, uh, with the understanding that the sense of life is not necessarily living, but might have something to do with death, is just as dumb, just as banal, just as low-level conversation as it is for science. It's not for nothing that, for example, in his fundamental ontology, Heidegger describes the structure of Dasein in terms that introduce an absolute asymmetry between life and death. If Dasein is first and foremost a being toward death, a formulation in which all the pressure is on the motion drawn out by the preposition, Dasein is, in its determinate structure, not a living being, and from a certain perspective, not even alive. Dasein, unlike you and me, unlike animals and unlike, unlike the gods, does not live. It exists, and in, the, and in this existence, that is, it is its own most possibility, it is actually, and it is the act of the potentiality most proper to it. And even in Husserl, whose philosophical conceptuality is shot through with certain inflections of life, whether it is the lived experience of Erlebnis, the Lebensfeld, the later work, or, most importantly, the livingness of what he calls the living present, the Bidiger Gegenwart, the present of the present as the necessary form of all experience, we never encounter a concept of life or the living, which, after all, is a matter best left to a regional ontology. Now, when Michel Henri concludes his enormous two-volume book on Marx with the affirmation that, quote, Marx's thought places us before the abyssal question, what is life? Henri poses a question that Marx does not dare to. For Marx, as Henri himself knows, the Henri who, just prior to posing this question in Marx's name, argues that the vision of communism posed by Marx is not an equitable distribution of socially produced wealth, but the withdrawal of what Henri calls living praxis from the sphere of production. That is, a praxis that will no longer be measured by objective conditions like value, money, and so on. Henri knows that for Marx, whether in the German ideology and its, quote, actually living individuals, unquote, whose praxis produces consciousness, or in the Grundrisse's enigmatic figure of a living labor that is paradoxically both the foundation of, and yet absolutely exterior to, productive labor in the genesis of value. It is not a question of life, but rather, rather the index, through the qualifier living, of the real, concrete relation of, or relation to self of an activity not regulated and normed by objective mediations. I began by making reference to Peter Medivar, excuse me if I don't pronounce his name correctly, some of you might know how to say this. Um, uh, uh, I began by making reference to Peter Medivar's remarks uh, on the quality of debate evidenced within the scientific community and specifically within biological sciences whenever it is, whenever it is a question of life and death not in, it, in order to introduce, uh, or excuse me, in order to address this question myself directly, or to weigh in on a debate that we've just been warned will assimilate those participating uh, in the ranks of gossipers and dinner table conversationalists, uh, that's the philosophers, but rather the stage of reading of a short text by Giorgio Agamben, first published in 1993, with a deceptively simple title, Form of Life, Forma di Vita, with a uh, little, uh, sort of um, dashes between uh, all three terms. And it's important uh, to make this point simply because uh, in this essay, there's a kind of um, uh, rather sort of like insistent um, differentiation and articulation of, on the one hand, 
the multiplicity of what he calls forms of life, with no dashes between the, uh, the, the terms, and the singularity of a form of life. And it's something that um, I think is important, at least as a kind of minor exegetical uh, question when it comes to sort of assessing what exactly this term might have meant uh, over the last uh, 15 years after it was introduced. And um, of course, more, more interesting in some sense is why the term emerges at all at a certain historical uh, moment or within a certain kind of uh, political conjuncture. And it's something that I'll, I'll try to sort of uh, brush up against um, as I move along. Just keep in mind this distinction between the singular form of life and the multiplicity of what he calls forms of life or forms of social life, even, which is a very loaded uh, formulation, I think. Okay, this text, which was originally published in the journal Future Interior, uh, a Parisian review that in the 1990s brought together various tendencies within, within Italian post urbanismo Michel Foucault's late work on biopower, and the thought of Gilles Deleuze, uh, this text would be situated at a switching point between the ethical and political reflections developed in the coming community, first published in 1990, and the appearance of the first volume of Homo, the Homo Sacra Suite in 1995. The coming community, will be recalled, proposed a convergence uh, between, for a moment, an ontological reflection on being, determined not as substance, predicate, or whatness, but as thusness, as what is its mode, manner, or how. An ethical reflection that located the possibility of ethics and the acting of one's own inactuality or potentiality, and a political project projection characterizing the coming politics, is the term that's repeated over and over again in the room, as a struggle between a community of whatever singularities who appropriate their own non-belonging, their own lack of proper identity or properties, and, quote, the state organization. And I should point out at this point, 1990, if anyone's interested, uh, the, the sort of logic and the sort of topological structure of sovereign power and its relationship to naked life, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a second, uh, is just beginning to be sort of developed. Uh, and so by 1990, around 1990 or so, the term that's often used is the simply state organization, uh, which is kind of stand in for some uh, sort of kind of post-Marxist uh, inheritance um, of a certain idea of the state form, but it hasn't yet um, uh, sort of opened it onto a kind of reflection on the logic of sovereign power and uh, the state's own. Now, in the Homo Sacra Suite, a series of texts that is now several books long, what is at stake is, as readers uh, like I'm well know, the topological relationship between sovereign or state power, defined as the capacity to decide on the state of exception, and the extraction or production of so-called naked life, that is, a life extracted or separated from its form, and exposed or abandoned to sovereign power over life and death. Now, the question of which, just what this form, uh, this form means will be crucial to the remarks that follow. But for the moment, I simply want to note that in the short transitional text on form of life, where this topological structure of internal exclusion between sovereign power and naked life is first proposed and not formalized, what is at stake is first and foremost not the nature of sovereign power and its obscure bearer, this term that's uh, often used, but of what Agamemnon calls, quote, a unitary power that constitutes the multiple forms of life as form of life. That is, in another quote, an antagonistic power, potenza, puissance, that should, he counsels, be the unitary center of the coming politics. Now, in this short text, then, Agamemnon projects two lines of inquiry centered on two antagonistic poles in contemporary politics the operations of sovereign power and the production of naked life, on the one hand, and the constitution, on the other, of a form of life that unifies or gathers, this is Agamemnon's term, together. Uh, what he here calls multiple forms of life. And elsewhere in the text, importantly, he qualifies these forms of life as multiple forms of social life. Uh, now, before returning to Agamemnon's citation of Medwell out there, I want to quickly propose an initial line of questioning for this short text and the specific passages I've already indicated proposes. If so much emphasis is placed uh, in the books that form um, the Homo Sacra configuration on the distinction in the Greek language, but also in the Greek thought between Zoe and Bios, kind of very well known uh, sort of shit almost um, in, in uh, this kind of series of books. That is between uh, the life that is indifferently distributed among animals, humans, and gods, and on the other hand, the way and mode or manner of life individuates either an individual or a group. What this doubling or division within what the modern language is a face with a single word life obscures is the triangulation of three terms, the God of 1993 text. Where it is a question, again, of naked life, 
you're identified with Zoe in two other terms, the multiplicity of forms of life, but if here it also been identified as social, and on the other hand, form of life that emerges as a power, let's see, a potenza, not a potere, antagonistic to sovereign power insofar as it is capable of resisting the sovereign operation of isolated naked life in its form. In short, then, three terms, two opposed operations. Starting from multiple forms of life, we witness the confrontation between the separation of a life and its form on the part of sovereign power. On the other hand, we are told of a coming anti-state politics that will be constituted through a practice that traverses without canceling the multiplicity of forms of social life, transforming this multiplicity of forms into a single form of life that is nevertheless traversed by a certain multitude of, and this is the term that, uh, that uh, Agamben will introduce at a certain point in his trajectory, multitude of, comes from Agamben, in fact, proceeding excuse me, from Dante, uh, Dante's book on monarchy. Finally, what we, uh, what we can think of uh, three separate situations as well. First, the normal situations, to use Agamben's term, in which naked life remains tied to forms of life and their social articulation. States of exception, in which naked life is abstracted from, or separated from, any form or mode of being, uh, by state or sovereign power. And finally, what we could call a revolutionary situation, in which a certain traversal of the multiplicity of forms of life occurs, a negation that's in no way symmetrical to that performed by sovereign power, a process that we must be reminded is both political and ontological in nature. Now, to return once again to Metabar's, the Metabar passage, Agamemnon cites this passage, it must be noted, not in order to confirm Metabar's position, but in order to demonstrate that in contemporary discussions of bioethics and biopolitics, that is, the increasingly dominant discourse of the Western biopolitical democracies, or the society of spectacle, as Agamemnon also puts it, what is most conspicuously lacking is any interrogation of the bio biological, medical, and scientific concept of life. Metamar's remark is marshaled in order to underline that the biological sciences, and more generally science, uh, uh, more generally science, does not even have a concept of life to begin with. It is, as I uh, tried to underline earlier, first and foremost a practice that has no need to reflect critically on its own conditions of possibility. With the result being the wholesale appropriation in contemporary political discourse of, quote, scientific pseudo-concepts, unquote, and pseudo-scientific representation of the body, unquote, that function primarily as a means of political control rather than guides for scientific inquiry. The contemporary political space of the biopolitical democracies, then, is one in which sovereign power and medico-scientific ideology converge. This convergence represents, in turn, a mutation within the nature of sovereign power itself, whose exceptionality, whose status is punctual decision that cuts across uh, the movement of everyday life in its forms, has now become banal. Increasingly medicalized space of everyday life, the integration of politics and medicine, produces a situation in which the same uh, sampling, prélèvements, the, the French translation, prélèvements, like extract uh, blood, for example, the same uh, sampling of naked life that the sovereign can perform in certain circumstances on forms of life is currently massively realized daily by pseudo-scientific conceptions of the body, sickness and health, and by the medicalization of increasingly vast spheres of life and individual imagination. Now, what is important about this passage, uh, for my purposes, is not the assessment of the exact nature of contemporary forms of domination, but rather the way in which the citation of Metabar allows Agam to propose what he considers a properly philosophical conception of life. This operation has two parts. First, the identification of the current spontaneous uh, philosophy of both biologists and bioethicists with a, quote, secularization. Let's say biological, is a sec biological life is a secularization of a properly uh, philosophical political concept of life. Uh, that is not as simply, uh, excuse me, Biological life is nothing more, uh, according to uh, this sort of um, intervention, than the secularization and depoliticization of a term that can only be understood through its intimacy with, uh, or to use a Lacanian term, its extant relation to sovereign power. But it's not as simply uh, as an object to be identified, evaluated, or measured, but as a condition whose production is the very definition of sovereign power. And then, inversely, another politics of life, another political operation the constitution of a form of life through what Madonna will enigmatically call thought. But why, in a political context in which the pseudo-concept of life 
has not only become an increasingly dominant reference, but has even made possible the banalization of the sovereign exception, introducing a certain indiscernibility between, quote, normal situations, uh, to, to use the term Agamemnon identifies with the multiplicity of social forms of life, and states of exception, in which these forms are, uh, are stripped away. Why, in this context, then, insist on a politics of life? That is, what Agamemnon calls, quote, a political life, oriented toward the idea of happiness and gathered up in a form of life, unquote. A non-state politics, or even anti-state politics, whose sole possibility, again, to quote Agamemnon, is an irrevocable exodus from any and all sovereignty, unquote. Uh, in a quote. I insist on this as a real question. Earlier, I, I underlined an absolutely asymmetrical relationship between naked life as the effect of sovereign power's decision and the practice that constitutes a form of life, even as both of these operations perform different forms of negation on the predicates and differential markers that structure forms of life in normal, quote unquote, social situations. This is important, I think, for there's a certain image of a godless thought, encouraged by certain passages from his work over the past 20 years, which contends that what is at stake in Gaman's political and historical thought is a variant of the Hudalinian formula according to which, quote, where the danger is, the saving power grows. Whatever the actual meaning of this formula as it surfaces in Hudalin's poetic work, the reading given to this phrase is always a catastrophic, that is, dialectical one. Salvation is looking more than the appropriation, conversion, or assumption of the danger itself. As if the content of catastrophe and salvation were the same, and that what must, must be produced is a new form of appearing of this content, that is, a new subjective relationship to it. Yet it's precisely this logic that Agamemnon swears off or disqualifies when he explicitly cites the tides elevation of naked life, or what he presumes or what he formalizes uh, uh, with regard to the Thais text. Uh, he explicitly cites the Thais elevation of this naked life in its very objection to the level of a superior principle, sovereignty or the sacred itself. And we should note that in this account of Thais thought, um, that in this kind of Thais thought, there is an immediate identification of objection and sovereignty, whether it be either a topological mapping of the relation between them or a process of appropriation. Um, Now, this asymmetry between naked life and a life of potential, vita di potenza, that is the form of life, this asymmetry between the operations of sovereign power and revolutionary politics would be more pronounced if this other of sovereign power were not also a politics of life, a politics that operates on forms of life. I've already mentioned uh, the manner in which Heidegger insists in his early fundamental ontology on the non-correlation between life and death, on a death that is the limit not of life, but of existence, of Dasein as being toward death, as that being that throws itself upon a pure possibility, its own. And even when Heidegger confronts the question of life directly, in his long reflection on the life of animals, in his famous seminar in 1929 1930, whose title does not refer to the outlined uh, to the figure of the animal, or even to the stimma of boredom, which concerns its first half, but to finitude, world, and solitude. So in this seminar, it's not in order to uh, offer a philosophical account or ontology of the living, but in order to insist on treating the animal not first as a living thing, but as a being that, unlike the worldless stone and world forming Dasein, has a very peculiar relation to the world. It has a world by being deprived of one. This is the source of what Heidegger strictly referred to as the animal's poverty. That is, a poverty without lack, or so Heidegger insists, as his treatment of the animal is, he claims, non normative where the situation of the animal, caught between the world as stone and the world building Dasein, suggests a certain kind of mediating figure, a kind, a kind of figure of negativity that marks, it makes passable, that makes possible the passage from the sphere of nature, the stone, to the kingdom of spirit. Uh, in this sense, it's a Hegelian configuration of movement. We can nevertheless, uh, in this context, context take Heidegger's word. Now, I emphasize the strategy on Heidegger's part in particular, in order to underline how striking the God's insistence on maintaining a certain symmetry, if not continuity, between two figures of life, naked life and life potential, mediated in their turn by a third term, or set of terms, the forms of social life encountered in so called normal situations. Indeed, in the first definitions of formal life offered by Agamemnon, his language exactly replicates the formulas used by Heidegger. 
famous formulas, which everyone knows, and describing the structure of Dasein. If Dasein if, if is that being for whom being itself is that issue or stake, the being for whom, to use the French translation, il y va de l'estonne. For Adam, in this form of life is a mode of living uh, in which in its concrete acts and its behavior or comportment, life itself is an issue. Il y va de la vie même. Il y va de la vie même. Just like the French translation of form of life. Agama develops this formula in which a form of life could be said to live in such a way that in each determined act, be it ethical, political, or a thought, would also simultaneously live or put into play its own potentiality, its own non-actuality, such that each act is irreducible to a fact or state of affairs, nor simply the actualization of a possibility or exercise of a faculty or capacity, but the existing instead of a potentiality. Now, this insistence on life and on a political life, and again, this is a Gaman's expression, in which an ontology of life as power is said to be, quote, immediately political, is, it should be pointed out, not anomalous at the historical conjuncture in which Agamemnon is writing. In the same year Agamemnon's short text was published, Jacques Derrida's Spectres of Marx appeared as well, a text which has as its core a reading of Marx's philosophy, that is, that layer or aspect of Marx's text which spontaneously secretes philosophical or metaphysical theses, since the fundamental operation of Derrida's reading is to locate a force of enunciation in Marx's text that breaks with, or is even antagonistic to, this very philosophical dimension of Marx's work and legacy. So a reading of Marx's philosophy then as an ontology of life, as founded on the, quote, hyper-phenomenological principle of the presence and flesh and bone of a living person, of the being itself, of its effective and non phantomatic uh, presence, of its flesh and bone presence, in the world. So on the basis of this principle, or rather this axiom, that is, this unverifiable decision or wager concerning life, uh, this, is, this is, of course, Derrida's reading of, of Marx. Um, that an entire philosophical critical system is launched in the form of an obsessive tracking down of phantoms, ghosts, and so on, a system equally visited by, counted, and pursued in its turn by the same ghosts it thinks it's chasing. Now, what is surprising about Derrida's reading of Marx, in those sections where he actually turns to the letter of Marx's text itself, is that it is nowhere a question of examining, for example, the antagonistic relation between living and dead labor, as it is developed elliptically in the Vigordrissa, but also presupposed throughout Marx. Rather than traverse this historically and materially determined space of antagonism, Derrida appeals uh, instead to, quote, all philosophies of life, indeed of the real or living individual, unquote, assigning Marx among these ranks while, in classical fashion, also drawing out a spectral thread or chain at work in Marx's textual practice that accepts it from its characterization as merely one philosophy and one philosophy of life, among others. Now, Derrida's reading of Marx, his strategic decision to read it through the prism of an ontology of life and to assimilate the Marxist thesis that identifies the source or effective genesis of value, the value of form and the living presence of labor to itself and its activity, to a philosophical thesis or position concerning life is inflected to an extent as yet developed, undeveloped, excuse me, uh, in commentaries on this work by his Hausen and Zetson with a two volume book on Marx by Michel Henri, I referred to earlier. I know Martin uh, knows this, this work very well. In this book, one finds a portrait of Marx as a thinker of uh, radical or absolute imminence of life to itself, a certain pathos or auto effective feeling of life that excludes all objectivity. That is, that murmurs beneath the fourfold or quadrupolar structure of correlation that guides all phenomenological investigations into the constitution of objectivity and the intentional life of subjectivity. Now, in qualifying or reinscribing this reading of Marx as a philosophy of life, Derrida insists that it's not a question of opposing this proposition. Derrida proposes to supplement, rather, this immediate self affection or auto production, that is, the auto production without objectivation of life with a logic of survival. And a spectral presence whose virtuality, let's say a real virtuality, really traces and affects in the present, if not constituting it in its very torn or ecstatic consistency, is not completely foreign to, at least in terms of structure, what Agamben calls uh, potentiality. Um, okay. So at this point, then, I want to address uh, what I consider to be the real stakes, then, of this short essay. In the final sections of, it, of this elliptic old text, Agamben develops what he calls form 
a term that uh, it should be quickly noted is quickly identified with a manner or mode. That is not with what life is, but how it is what it is. So it's the difference between maybe a political question and a scientific uh, question. Through the figure of thought, the life of potentiality is first of all determined by the activity of thought. Thought understood in the terms Aristotle fantasy develops in De Anima. Thought is a sense, among others. But, it's an, it, it, but is, it is an exception to the activity of sensation insofar as, unlike taste, touch, uh, sight, or audition, it is a being, Aristotle observes, whose nature is to be the homme puissance, to be inactual, to be potential. That is, a being whose being is to remain inactual in the very movement of its actualization. Or better, that capacity that in each determined act, with each determined content of thought, also experiences or feels its own capacity to be affected as such. Now, importantly, Agamemnon quickly grasps the experience of thought to another post aristotelian conception of thought or the intellect, namely the Averroian affirmation of a, quote, single possible intellect accessible to all men. That is, the very potentiality of thought experiencing each determined act is identified with the universality or the singularity, maybe, the free individual diffuse nature of the intellect itself. Thought is a sense. Thought senses its own potentiality in exercising itself. Thought, and this potentiality is precisely the common or diffuse nature of the intellect, what exceeds uh, any process of individuation. This conception of the intellect is a this conception of the intellect as a common power is, according to Agamemnon, what marks the threshold of modern political thought. The rupture first formulated in the 14th century by Marcelino Padua. And more importantly, uh, Dante Alighieri's uh, De Buona Um I'm going to sort of move uh, past um, a few of these uh, remarks. Um, I was going to say something, uh, or at least sort of um, draw out the way in which the term multitude is introduced into um, uh, Agamemnon's uh, really sort of elliptical conception of thought as a kind of third term along with. Uh, Thought as potentiality, thought as a common power through the Averroian conception of the intellect, and then finally, uh, thought as, as um, structured by what he calls a multitude, which he distinguishes both from the individual and from uh, uh, groups of individuals, city states, what have you. And um, it's a term which, in a certain sense, in the language of, of or the idiom of Dante, uh, would sort of correspond to what he calls forms of life. And so the multitude term comes to sort of stand in within the kind of structure of Dante's argument for uh, the term formal life in Agamemnon's argument. But formal life in Agamemnon's argument is a kind of singular figure. This multitude, of course, is, is uh, supposed to suggest a kind of um, imminent multiplicity. And so that question of two different forms of multiplicity, the multiple forms of social life and the multitude inherent to a form of life is where a great deal of the sort of uh, movement of the, the, the essay takes place. But I'm going to see this. Okay. Uh, now, this is all relatively schematic, but these propositions are the condition for understanding Agamemnon's intervention in this text. The final paragraph is clear. It's only when we can see that the multitude is a common power of the intellect, as that thought which traverses the multiplicity of forms of life in order to reconstitute them as a form of life in its multitude, or as a multitude, that the nature of the, quote, Marxist general, general intellect takes on its full significance. Multitude, general intellect. It is to Antonio Negri, and to some extent, Paolo Mirna, that these lines are addressed. And in particular, these two passages, which I will want to begin my conclusion with. Here's the first passage. Quote, this is a comment, of course, the very last paragraph. Intellectuality and thought are not one form of life among others, which articulates life and social production. The second, which follows directly upon this first proposition, is that what is at stake in the coming politics is the clarification of the difference between and again, I quote, the simple and massive inscription of social knowledge in the production process, this is what Marx calls general intellect in the, the Andresa, uh, which, which characterizes the current phase of capitalism, and uh, intellectuality as antagonistic power, again, potenza, antagonistic power in the form of life. Two figures of the multitude, one, a name for the articulation of life and social production, uh, or two, the simple, uh, excuse me, Two figures of the multitude. One, a name for the articulation of life and social production, or the, quote, simple inscription of knowledge, uh, of social knowledge and production process. And on the other hand, formal life as an antagonistic power. 
How much? Uh, how long have I gone? I can't tell. You're me. okay. I'm okay. All right. Because I. Okay. Now, if we quickly trace the evolution of, of Negri's uh, work as it changes the uh, course between the 70s and the late 90s, that is particularly after the crushing of the, of the autonomia movement by the Italian state uh, and an historically compromised uh, Italian Communist Party, his own arrest and his subsequent turn to the philosophy of Spinoza uh, in the Savage Phenomena, we find it characterized by an ontologization of the proletariat as a productive force in its living labor even life itself. Where in the mid to late 1970s, Negri attempted to expand or even surpass the classical definition of worker identity by including classically non-productive or reproductive labor within it, a tenuous theorization that, that was nevertheless an attempt to diagram the con conflictual dynamics of the area of autonomia. This figure, the socialized worker, and these new, quote, social subjects came by the 1980s and 1990s to be, to be defined as an ontological power, cast in Spinozan terms as an infinite substance as expressing itself through the production of difference. Where the Negri of the 1970s defined a socialized worker by its dual capacity for sabotage, on the one hand, that is, an antagonistic withdrawal of labor power as a source of value, and for what he called the language of capital itself, self-valorization. By the 1990s, in the book Empire, the multitude, uh, multitude uh, came to be understood simply as life itself, producing itself as value, however immeasurable. This life, as Henry puts it in a recent text, quote, leads a life parallel with respect to constituted power. Now this later Negri, in which the mass worker and its refusal of work assumes the form of the socialized worker, and finally the multitude as living labor, or quite simply life itself, life as potentiality, must be read against the more classical formulations of worker antagonism found in the essays of Mario Tronti in the 1970s. For Mario Tronti, the Copernican Revolution, represented by the Italian tendency called the Popalismo, uh, and its method of reading Marx, meant that the history of capitalism or the capital relation was neither simply a phase in the development of productive forces, nor a system of logical categories for absolute to relative surplus value, say, or a formal real subsumption of labor by capital, developing according to their own internal necessity, as if the history of capital was nothing more than its own becoming increasingly adequate to its concept. To the contrary, the wager axiom articulated by Tronti was that capital has no history of its own, and that its mutations are compelled by pressures exerted by proletarian aggression and antagonism. A proletariat is defined not by its capacity to produce surplus value, but by its refusal of its own identity as a class, as a class defined by work. This refusal of work, the struggle against work, this relentless sabotage of its own identity as a commodity, as labor power, that is sold in exchange for wages, cannot be reduced to a simple resistance on the part of a living labor community to its domination by capital. Its definition, if this word even applies, is articulated in its act of destruction or sabotage of its own objective existence as labor power, its own identity as a category of capital, and as an objective component in the organic and technical composition of, uh, of capital, as variable capital, for example. In this way, the building or construction of a worker power, to use the name of an organization that emerged in Trotsky's way, or in the wake of Trump's work, and which included among its founders Negri, requires the destruction of worker identity and the abolition of the objective existence of the working class, that is, as a class as a productive force. Now, the figure of the worker then is not to be situated at some point exterior to the capital relation, an image as a living labor or as a creative force crushed by the dead weight of the past, let's say dead labor, as a production, productive energy that is siphoned off by some vampire whose days are all the same numbered. The proletariat is not one polar relation from which it might draw in order to come into its own, but nothing more than what Benjamin Noyes refers to as a, quote, relation of rupture, unquote, an activity of sabotage or undermining the relation that is the whole of its existence. Um, the proletariat is for Tronti, neither an ontological given, uh, that aliens that it's held in the form of capital, nor is, nor is it an historical force that might survive its own mutual implication in the capital relation, or that it's organizing itself into socialist or communist relations that would still be governed by the categories of capital, value, production, work. Now, to return to Agamemnon's concluding paragraph, uh, Agamemnon's concluding paragraph then stakes out the space in which this figure of thought develops in the second half of his essay, Thought's Potentiality, exercising itself, uh, thought as a common power, thought as thought of the multitude. Um, it's here where the, it's uh, in this framework that this intervention assumes its value. That is to say, in relationship to the 
in relation to the tradition, the Italian Polarismo tradition, sorry, uh, for whom Marx's so-called fragment or machines from the Verdrissa was so crucial. Now this tendency, whose Copernican revolution method I just sketched out for the work of Dranti, is important not only for its emphasis on the passage in the Verdrissa, the specific passage in the Verdrissa, but for its articulation of two decisive yet enigmatic threads in these notebooks, namely the theme of the gentle intellect on the one hand and that of living labor on the other. Living labor, to recall and expand what I've undermined, is understood by Marx and by this tendency to be not simply a transcendental condition of productive labor. That is, labor is labor power, labor is capital, labor is productive of value and surplus value, but an active material force at the heart of the capital relation. A force that, while supplying productive labor for the of capital and salarization, antagonistically hollows out a space of self-valorization internal to this process itself. The expansion of, quote, worker needs to use the language of the late 60s, an expansion of worker demands that escalates according to its own exigencies, independent of the logic of the validation of capital, and any correlation between uh, wages and productivity, to, to be more specific. To this figure of living labor, understood not as an ontologically creative force, much less as life itself, but as a lever of antagonism at the heart of the capital relation, is what Edward Marx calls the general intellect. The general intellect refers to the moment in the development of the productive forces when scientific knowledge and the accumulation of knowledge produced collectively by society over the course of centuries, indeed, comes to be an immediate and dominant force in the production process. This knowledge, or this common power, to use Agamemnon's terms, assumes material form in increasingly complex machines and systems of automation, which replace both the physical exertion characteristic of previous figures of labor power and the quantity of labor time necessary, necessary for the production of social wealth. Indeed, for Marx, what is decisive about this moment when the general intellect, and again, that's scientific abstract knowledge for, for Marx, uh, comes to dominate the production process, is that at a certain point, with a proportional diminution of labor time in the production process, labor time itself can no longer function as the measure of value. So monstrous, that in this is Marx's word, ungeheuer, I think is the, the, the term, so monstrous is the disproportion between labor time and produced wealth. For Marx, this is a breaking point, a mode of production founded in the production founded on the production of exchange value, that is on the extraction of surplus labor, literally has no sense that the quantity of surplus labor time uh, is reduced to an absolute minimum, that is to say, to next to nothing. Now, a gun's intervention is simply this. For the Marxist thesis to, quote, acquire its sense, the gun is constantly uh, doing this. Like he says, you can only understand this thesis if you actually assume the rather sort of enigmatic trajectory I, I produced in passing from Dante to Averroes to a passage in uh, Diana that's quite famous. Uh, now, to acquire its sense, it must be understood not in terms of the objectification of scientific knowledge in the form of fixed capital, but only from the perspective of the figure of thought he's outlined, by which is meant the concept of the general intellect only assumes its properly antagonistic character when it is no longer understood, as Marx himself does, as, quote, the simple mass of inscription of social knowledge in the production process. Then this is the end of uh, God's essay. Agamemnon's point is clear. What Marx in 1858 projected as a crisis for capitalism, that is, like all crises, an objective disproportion between labor time and social wealth that actually, in fact, transcodes a subjective antagonism, is quite simply the current phase of capitalism, that is, the society spectacle. A few lines earlier, Agamemnon clarifies the position. The general, int the general intellect, if it is to attain its sense as a concept, cannot be understood as, quote, a form of life among others in which life and social production are articulated, quote. Um, now, I'm, I've just got another page left. I've already developed what I consider the most important aspect of Bagama's intervention in this text, namely the triadic schema of naked life, multiple forms of social life, and form of life, a form of life. Naked life is to recall the salient point, the life common to animals, gods, humans, you and me, and in contemporary political democracies, the generic part of humanity understood as the most minimal and abject, abject excuse me, frame in which to operate on and devastate modes of living, or life forms to use Evans' transposition. Uh, the form of life is, in its very plurality, uh, the world of life itself, in its very plurality, is, is recoded in so-called normal situations and into an array of juridico-social identities. And examples, finally, that Agamemnon gives are, quote, voter, employee, journalist, student, 
person with AIDS, transvestite, porno star, el the elderly, parent, woman. So this is kind of, one, one assumes this is not an exhaustive list, but <laughs> nevertheless you can, uh, you can sort of see a kind of um, bifurcation within the list between these kind of uh, modes of, of um, civic life and then uh, kind of sexualization. Although the elderly, I'm not sure the sexualization quite uh, works there, but I'm sure that there's some sequence between elderly, parent, and so on. Um, now, okay, so I'm going to uh, precipitate the conclusion. Now, where the workers' tradition sees a general intellect as the contemporary form that living labor assumes, as an antagonism internal to the capital relation, Agamemnon asserts that this reading of, of the general intellect reduces it to a form of life among others, that is, the contemporary form of capitalism itself, in which life as a power is objectified in fixed capital, the machines, systems of automation, and the spectacle. What is cru what, but what is crucial to the workerist reading of the general intellect is precisely its assertion that what Marx calls the general, general intellect is not simply the accumulation of abstract scientific knowledge in the form of fixed capital, that is, the articulation of life and social production, of life as capital, but a set of capacities that are social in nature they cannot be objectified in the form of machinery, and more generally, cannot be appropriated as capital. Forms of life, precisely. Vierno, for example, speaks, speaks of linguistic competence, the circulation of affects, and ethical tendencies. And insofar as these forces accumulate around the figure of the general intellect, the contemporary form of production necessarily announces, announces not simply a disproportion between labor time and social wealth, but a bifurcation, which is not necessarily antagonistic, more of a question of separation between production, uh, productive forces, and the general intellect. Now, what Agamemnon proposes is, in fact, then, two forms of antagonism, or maybe three. These depend on two different logics of power. For the Marxist tradition has a, spe has a specificity, which is precisely that it proposes a logic of power that is irreducible to the classical framework of state or sovereign power. And what Agamemnon proposes precisely is a confrontation with state power. Quote, Confronted with state sovereignty, which can affirm itself only in separating in each domain naked life from its form, intellectuality, or thought, is the power that incessantly reunites life with its form or prevents their association. So, uh, to conclude in, in a kind of very, very schematic way, it seems to me that what um, is proposed in the government's uh, sort of uh, articulation of the questions or the, the sites of living labor, general intellect, and form of life are three different figures of antagonism. And ultimately, I think this is the, the, the materialist question um, for me. The question of um, materialism not as a kind of epistemological problem um, or even a methodology, but as a, a, as a sort of strategic way of mapping antagonisms and trying to understand materiality as this, um, this kind of in terms of a logic of antagonism. So three different figures of antagonism. One, living labor is a material force internal to the capital relation and a kind of site or kind of uh, praxis of self valorization internal to the, this kind of antagonistic relationship between living labor and productive capital, and, or productive labor and capital. A second one, which is to say a properly uh, post-workerist uh, conception of the general intellect, not as the simple inscription of social knowledge in the form of fixed capital and machines, but a kind of bifurcation between the general intellect as living labor uh, and uh, capital as fixed capital. And then finally, uh, in Agamemnon's conception of formal life and as, uh, as a figure of antagonism, it's precisely antagonism not between uh, a figure of labor, even living labor, as a kind of uh, point of internal exteriority in the capital relation, but form of life as, as a kind of resistance to, that's a language, uh, a kind of non-antagonistic language, right? and a resistance to exodus from state or sovereign power in its operations. Um, so, in any case, I'll, I'll leave it there, and hopefully we can uh, we'll have time to discuss uh, if there are things to discuss. So.